Okay, welcome back to Oracle Open World Live. We are live here in San Francisco, California. This is Oracle Open World's coverage of, uh, uh, of theCUBE. theCUBE is here, and we're going to go live to the keynote. I'm here with Dave Vellante. Um, Larry Ellison, breaking news, is not attending the uh, keynote. I'm just listening in the other ear. Uh, breaking news, Larry Ellison will not be delivering today's keynote. Instead, it's Thomas Kurian, uh, his uh, almost you know, a, you know, chief of staff, if you will, going to be delivering the news. That's the big news today. Larry Ellison on the boat, trying to win America's Cup, will not be giving the keynote. Dave, implications. Well, he'd be here, but he had something better to do. <laughs> <laughs> on a boat, <laughs> on a boat. You know, it's funny, John, um, on the last earnings call, uh, Saffer said that, uh, or whoever the host of the call was, said that Larry would be here, but there's a big race. And <laughs> Larry's got his priorities straight. I mean, why not, right? What is Larry, 67 years old? No, let's see, we're at 26 billion, so. I mean, you know, it's a big disappointment for the audience, I think. Uh, I mean, the audience comes here, it's a packed house. I was just in there, it's, it's fire marshal full. And I think there's a lot of disappointed people, and poor Thomas Curian, who's a very good speaker, but I mean, to have Larry Ellison say, please deliver my keynote, that's, uh, those are big shoes to fill. So, so Dave, we're here for Oracle Open World coverage of theCUBE. Do you like that intro on the intro? A little yeah, slip think, there. I think, uh, I think I like Open the way World that should sounds. cover theCUBE. I yeah. think Oracle Open World covering theCUBE <laughs> is a great uh, strategy. Um, but they're announcing human capital management, again, this is a big disappointment for everyone here at the show, obviously. Um, Larry Ellison's keynotes are awesome. Um, amazing to watch a guy of that level of experience, a stature, give a keynote. Always fun to watch. Um, just the commentary, his point of view is always fun, but he's got something better to do. He's on a boat. He's America's I, I'm bummed, I mean, uh, he's, it's always a highlight, right? And when, when, remember when he gave the keynote, and, and it was right around the time, I think his, his friend Steve Jobs had just passed, right? Yeah. Now, I, I believe they didn't tell him, right? Is that correct? Do you remember that story? Well, no, it, it was the last day of Oracle World, I think two year, over two years ago. I remember we were breaking down when the news delivered, but, um, you know, Larry Ellison's a statesman. He's a statesman. He's a, you know, the longest reigning CEO in the tech history right now. That's uh, in terms of like incumbent CEOs. And the thing about Larry is, is that he's entertaining on stage, um, but yet he's competitive. So, you know, I think, Honestly, it's, I would be rather, I would be at the boat, boat as well. If they pull off the comeback, they would have run, won what, five in a row? Five races in a row? Um, basically the largest comeback uh, in America's Cup history, so wish him well. Um, Dave, obviously a little bit boring, sober note here with the, with the intro without Larry. What's your take on their, with Oracle Open World uh, versus uh, Workday? What do you think about those well, two? Well, you know, in a way, it's kind of, um, it's kind of fitting, actually, that Larry's not here today because in a, in a lot of ways, I think Larry would do what he always does and, and really uh, put forth a very strong position of Oracle versus the other guys. And, and Oracle Open World, I think this year, unlike other years at, uh, at, at this event, has really tried to be more partner friendly. Uh, you saw Safra Katz this morning uh, talking about Joe Tucci in very glowing terms, talking about how, how Joe is her friend and Joe returning and reciprocating that compliment. Um, and you know, Oracle talking in the cloud uh, discussion this morning, talking uh, about open, embracing OpenStack to a certain degree. So, you know, may, maybe that's kind of just antithetical to the way <laughs> Larry's t keynotes typically go. Uh, but I think, John, in, in, in general, that's all window dressing. When you talk to the people in the field, Oracle and its competitors are, 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 are competing very fiercely, whether it's Workday, Salesforce, uh, uh, EMC and the like, they are going head to head and going hard against Oracle and vice versa. I mean, one of the things that's interesting I find is that Oracle is, has really built themselves up, Dave. We were talking to EMC earlier and they've really, really transformed themselves to irrelevant, you know, to very relevant relative to the product announcements. And I got to say, Larry sharpened the pencil a little bit, got down to brass tacks, and he delivered the cloud, he delivered now in memory, he's got delivering, you know, obviously a more robust cloud solution with mobile. But you know, five years ago, Oracle was just extracting rents out of the market, relational database, licensing issues, you know, and, and conversely, VMware was having the same issues. You remember the VMware licensing issues, you know, uh, virtualizations are hitting the scene. You know, Oracle's incumbent position has is, is changed a lot. Well, I think it is still st extracting rent. I mean, look at the deal it did with Salesforce, right? The word in the street is that Salesforce did that deal because Oracle was threatening a huge audit, and they were going to have to pay more to Oracle for the audit, so they figured, all right, well, we might as well just 
buckle under and do a huge deal with Oracle and, and announce it and you know, give Oracle a little love. We'll get a little press out of it as well. And then, of course, Salesforce turned around a couple weeks later and did a big deal with Workday, one of Oracle's you know, biggest competitors. We know the story well. Dave Duffield and Anil Bushri. Um, they don't like Oracle. You know, when Oracle took over their company with a hostile takeover, they literally started Workday the day the, the deal went down and, and have built a very successful enterprise. Uh, I think that, so in, in a lot of ways, John, I think Oracle still is extracting rents from, from its customers. Uh, at, at the same time, Oracle's strategy is to make its offering so alluring that customers are willing to pay those rents. So it's a high rent district. <laughs> Dave, what's your take on, on um, EMC versus Oracle? We talked about their transformation. We had um, Dorian in here earlier, oh, 15 years, you know, the, you know, the messaging from EMC, you know, 15 year relationship. But four years ago, that relationship was on the rocks. I yeah, mean, so, what's your take on that? So I think that um, the reality is that e EMC is, or Oracle's always looked at EMC as a, as a company that sells hardware that can make its software run faster. Oracle's never, really been interested in, in helping its partners. Oracle's always been interested in making its software run better. EMC has 80,000 Oracle customers. That's twice the number of customers that Oracle has for its own hardware business. So EMC has a big footprint and a big presence in Oracle's customer base. The challenge for EMC is the EMC doesn't sell typically to the DBAs. EMC is selling to the infrastructure heads. Now you're seeing EMC messaging increasingly, especially in this show, geared toward the DBAs. They understand that's where the bread is buttered in this Oracle community. So, I think that you're seeing very much head-to-head -head competition. Now here's the reality of Oracle storage business. Oracle storage business, when you put it up head-to-head -head with EMC storage business, it really, it, it, except in a few places, is not competitive. Uh, EMC is much, much stronger storage company, but, so the way Oracle intends to compete is to vertically integrate and leverage the advantage of its engineered systems. So Oracle, like no other, can engineer throughout the stack. EMC can't, EMC can only go up to the database and then stops. I'll give you an example. Oracle only allows Oracle hybrid columnar compression to run on Oracle storage. So if you plug in EMC storage to an Oracle environment, it won't be able to turn on Oracle columnar compression. So Oracle is essentially controlling the protocols throughout the stack to its competitive advantage. Now over time, I believe, and David Floyer believes, that Oracle will have to open that up because the customers will demand it, but right now, Oracle is stacking the deck so that it can catch up to some of its competitors in hardware. The other point I want to make, John, is we heard Thomas Curian this morning talk about how Oracle has a leadership position in like 92 product categories. The fact of the matter is that Oracle is known for its database. Uh, I think you're, you know, you know, while maybe the numbers add up, for leadership in other areas, Oracle is not known for number one leadership in all those categories outside of database. So the big question around the vertically integrated stack approach is, can Oracle really truly get to best of breed across that entire stack? It believes it can. It believes it can stack the deck to its advantage to buy some time, and it's going to spend a lot of money on R&D to try to get there. You're watching uh, Silicon Angles, The Cube, our flagship program, where we go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We're here commentating on the keynote that didn't happen with Larry Ellison, but it's happening with Thomas Curian. And they're talking about the human capital stack, the customer experience, Oracle Cloud. You're seeing on the right-hand side of the screen there, um, content, social, uh, marketing, commerce, sales and service. This is the portfolio of the future. They're calling it the cloud, mobile, social. Something that we were based upon, founded upon, Dave. And uh, you know, with that, just want to give a quick programming note. The Cube will be at um, Strata Hadoop World in New York City for a special presentation on October 28th and the 30th uh, for Big Data New York City. So follow the hashtag Big Data NYC for a special SiliconANGLE Wikibon Cube broadcast, two days live in New York City for all the action in big data. In, uh, at the same time, we'll be doing some coverage of Hadoop World. Um, that's going to be some great coverage. We're going to have Mike Olson on later today, CEO of Cloudera. I'm sorry, the former CEO of Cloudera, now uh, uh, VP of Strategy. Chief, Chief Strategy Officer, Chief and, he's, and he's still chairman, right? Yeah, still chairman, uh, still player over there. He's a great guy, Mike Olson, friend of the company, friend of the Cube. Uh, we're also going to have Max Shearson on, who's the CEO of MongoDB. Um, yeah, we had Max on at the, uh, the MongoDB days down in New York City earlier this year. Yeah, so, so this is the new school, Dave. The new school is all about uh, unstructured data and uh, stay with us. But Dave, I've got to ask you about this, this, the, um, the stack wars, right? 
Joe Tucci today, we have a differentiated stack is what he said, and that is uh, horizontal. Amazon has a great stack for developers, and the developer community knows that, and they do things and make it really easy for developers. So the word stack is becoming the, the du jour, kind of under the hood. We use the analogies of the auto industry, how tech's becoming very much a fan base like cars, right? Is people are interested in what's going on under the hood. So I got to ask you, the stack conversation, what does that mean to you? I have a stack, everyone has a stack. What does that mean and, and why is it important? So, I think this is a critical issue in the industry right now. Uh, I think there's a couple things here. Number one, a fully integrated stack means that you're shifting the customer labor which is a very, we're a very intensive labor uh, comp component in the IT industry. You're shifting labor costs into the R&D of the vendors. It's high time we did that. Probably 60 to 65% of the cost of managing servers and storage over the life of that infrastructure is labor. So it's high time that, that vendors integrated. And, it, and, it, and it, of course, it, the technology became available to integrate servers and storage and networking, and of course, virtualization was one of the key components there. I think the second thing is, that by integrating these stacks, you get a much more seamless service experience. Uh, we've had Mike Capellas on. VCE was one of the first companies really to stress this. Mike Capellas, very uh, 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 in a very articulate way, communicated the benefits to an IT practitioner of not having to patch, not having to test, faster deployment, all those things. So, those are huge factors. I think the third thing is you can really drive application performance when you have better integration. So those three factors are critical. Now, how do you integrate is the religious war. Because Oracle owns basically the entire stack, it's saying, hey, we're going to vertically integrate across that entire stack. IBM is the same way, I'll come back to that in a minute. EMC, of course, doesn't own the entire stack. It really doesn't participate in the database and applications market, you know, notwithstanding uh, uh, Greenplum. You know, it's not a core database company. So what it does is it partners with the likes of Cisco and others, uh, certainly Intel, betting on industry standard, so-called commodity hardware with software layered on top and an ecosystem approach to compete with the Oracle stack. Now come back to IBM. Only IBM has a, a, as robust of a stack as Oracle, and I would argue that Oracle stack is even deeper for, here's the reason why. Oracle really focuses on that engineered hardware and software together. Now IBM does the same thing, but IBM really butters its bread with services. And so IBM, I think, is not as intensely focused on that integration as a company from top to bottom as Oracle is. And I think that gives Oracle advantage. Now, if I had to compete with Oracle, or if I had to, had to, had, uh, had to purchase Oracle as a practitioner, I would certainly look at the open ecosystem as a way to get more leverage, and I would pick on Oracle's you know, perceived lack of openness and I think real lack of openness. So John, that's, that's my take. Now, you come at it from a different angle, right? You're out here in Silicon Valley, you, you hear all the scuttlebutt. I'd love to hear your perspective on the stack wars. Well Dave, I mean, it's an interesting perspective. I mean, if you live in Silicon Valley like I do, you can see a lot of emerging technologies, a lot of the startups, and I think what I find interesting is again, I, I, you know, the success of theCUBE and SiliconANGLE Wikibon with our open source content model is kind of proof points to what that we're talking about with Silicon Valley is that the tech business is becoming, ha having a very broad fan base. When I was uh, in my 20s, we would, the, the tech community was smaller and you know, it was you know, kind of geeky. Tech now is mainstream, so I compare it to the car industry when it really became a, a hobbyist market. People really do care what's under the hood, like car buffs care about what engines, V6, V8, and then you know, obviously all the amenities of cars and car racing. So, you know, and, and you're seeing obviously Jeremy Burr with EMC has that whole, have the same philosophy. I believe that the tech business has a, tr a broader appeal, and in Silicon Valley it's highlighted by the startups. In the startup community, I think Amazon really set the stage to me with cloud on how they handle their stack. They treat the cloud as a developer environment and cater everything to the developer. And that's why startups love the cloud there because the stacks are integrated. You can do some node on the front end and have an elastic beanstalk on the back end. All the stuff maps in there for you and does all the work. That's like DevOps. That's the modern era. And I think that is what EMC is talking about when Joe Tucci says, hey, we can have a stack. And that's why I think the differentiation is going to be for these companies is to enable these proprietary or proprietary assembled stacks, but it has to work in context with other vendors. So to me, that's a differentiator. That's the new architecture. The modern era is about having those building blocks, 
tools for the right job, and uh, I think that's, that's kind of where it's going to go. So, you know, we talk, we've talked about this all week here, and theCUBE is, uh, in, in, in many senses, it's, it's working. Um, I, I talked about the cash flow machine that is Oracle. Oracle's throwing off $14 billion of free cash flow in the last 12 months. I mean, I think that's just phenomenal. It's a $39 billion company with a $160 billion market cap. Now, it is bad, it's really got about 39% you know, uh, operating margin annualized. It did 45% operating margin last quarter. Nobody's got operating margins like that in the industry, not even Microsoft. So something's obviously working there. Uh, having said that, Sun has definitely been a drag on earnings. Um, you know, or the Sun business is down, the revenue is down, uh, the valuation from a revenue multiple standpoint is, is slightly down from, from the pre-Sun days. Now those are other, other factors in there. The question is, John, has Oracle changed the game? In my opinion, it has. You know where I stand on this. I've had you know, vehement arguments with a number of folks in the industry about that Sun acquisition. I think it was a game changer. Uh, I, I know I've had you know, battles with many uh, on this topic. But my feeling is that Ellison saw the opportunity to simplify the infrastructure, be the apple of the enterprise, and that's really what he's, he's going towards. So, so my view, uh, uh, Oracle's got absolutely we'll the right strategy. However, is it the right strategy in all cases for customers? No, here's why I think that. You got breaking news? Breaking news, uh, breaking in here, just coming off the Twitter wire 17 seconds ago. Oracle has tied it up, 8-8. Eight, eight. Tomorrow, the final race, if the biggest comeback in history, America's Cup. So Larry Ellison, I mean, he might be coming in with champagne. Yeah, I hope he shows up buzzed, because if he comes in buzzed and excited, um, the breaking news here is that Oracle has just tied it up in one of the most craziest comebacks in the history of sailing, racing here in San Francisco, nonetheless. Um, you know, I wonder if Larry paid the Kiwis to throw, throw it. What do, you, what do you think? I mean, you think he might have like paid it to throw it? I mean, come on. So you think uh, he's having, no one loses that bad, come on. You think he's having more fun at the race or more fun at the uh, uh, Oracle Open World? I think, <laughs> uh, I think he's uh, having more fun at the race. So I just want to cut in, didn't mean to cut you off. Um, he skips, Larry Ellison skips the keynote here at Oracle Open World to attend the boat at uh, the sailing here in America's Cup in San Francisco. Treacherous conditions, the currents, the winds, multiple wind holds here uh, in San Francisco over the race. Again, Oracle down, devastating. They were literally about to lose that one race when they had to call it last week. Now tied it up 8-8. Eight, eight. Amazing story, Dave. Yeah, so um, now what's the story? What's, what's the deal? Tomorrow is the... Is the is tomorrow the... is the final deciding race. Okay, so well, it's not like, we're not likely to see Larry tomorrow either then, are we? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sure he's basking in the glory right now, but uh, congratulations to Larry Ellison and the America's Cup team, that's what it's all about. Uh, if they can pull it off, it'll be a great win, so. Now you remember the days, you know, you, you, were, you used to be an East Coast guy, you remember the days when the America's Cup was in Newport, right? And you remember what the boats used to look like back then, right John? <laughs> <laughs> Ray Wang, Ray Wang's tweet, Oracle should just show uh, the race and have Larry Ellison helicoptered in and film it live all the way in. <laughs> well, if he had Google Glass, like Sergey Brin, who jumped out of a Zeppelin for Google I.O., that would top the best keynote speech in the history of uh, the tech conferences. If you can recall, Google I.O. last year, Sergey Brin jumped out of a Zeppelin and landed on top of Moscone, rappelled down the ropes and bicycled in to the keynote. Larry Ellison, he can come in off the chopper, that'd be a home run. So Thomas Kurian is uh, giving Larry's keynote. He's, he's actually switching his own slides, it looks like, so he's not invoking <laughs> you know, Larry's just, No offense, but he's a snoozer. He's Next not, not uh, he can't he, carry like Larry but does. But he's very good, he's very solid, but it's, it's a big disappointment. Larry Ellison, always a highlight of this event. Uh, he really does a good job of you know, summarizing the event, taking some shots at the competition, Given us, John, a lot to talk about and write about. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, so we're here live. Uh, this is day two for us. Uh, what do we got coming up this afternoon, John? We got, you know, Sam Lucida was on this morning. He was uh, part of Joe Tucci's keynote. Uh, EMC and Fujitsu, you know, paid a lot of dough to do those keynotes, you know, probably upwards of a million dollars. Do you think that's worth it, John? I do. I think. Um First of all, the whole payola thing in the conference, is, is it's, it's now practice, now people do that. And obviously, Joe Tucci gets a morning slot. Um, but you know what, it's a million dollar commitment, it's a huge event here, it costs a lot of dough to put it on. A small price to pay for EMC, who's got the dough to do it. Um, 
But I think it's worth it, I think, to get in front of the, the customers here at Oracle, where Joe Tucci can heartfeltly say, hey, we care, thank you for your business, and also get that warm welcome, my friend. You know, it's funny, I, you know, I hear that, and I think, they're, of course they're friends, they're making a boatload of money together. Um, EMC quite doing well with the relationship on the alliance front, uh, but Joe Tucci's a statesman, and he's out there, he's got a lot of class, and he's humble. He's the kind of guy you can see him, you know, sitting there having a stogie in the north end, you know, a slice of pizza on his lap, having a beer, you know, just kind of being a regular guy, but he actually is smart, he's leading a big company, I call him the CEO of the decade, and then he passes the baton to the rising star at EMC, Jeremy Burton, who came in from Oracle, um, came in from an Oracle background, engineering background. We interviewed him on theCUBE first four years ago. VP of Marketing, becomes CMO, now he's EVP of Product and Operations um, and Solutions. Jeremy Burton made a ton of money as we disclosed, uh, was disclosed in the marketplace last year, earned it. Rising star, Jeremy Burton. He went down to the meat and potatoes, the nuts and bolts of the demo, and I thought uh, that was uh, fantastic. So I want to hear what Stan has to say about that. Uh, also, Mike Olson from Cloudera is going to be in here. I'm very interested to hear from Mike about what's going on in the Hadoop world uh, this year and also in the Hadoop ecosystem. Obviously, it's a battle of the two titans, Hortonworks and Cloudera. Cloudera clearly in the lead from day one. Hortonworks rising fast to a quick number two, nipping at the heels of Cloudera. Some say uh, about to make a pass on Cloudera in terms of the market leadership. And I think that's something that I want to ask Mike is, Mike, how do you maintain your lead? How do you compete against the Teradatas of the world? How do you compete in the data warehouse market? Are, do you have the right sets of solutions? And also, was Pat Gelsinger correct when he said there'll be no red hat for Hadoop? These are the things I want to talk about Mike Olson about, Dave, and, and it'll be interesting. So, um, And then Max Shireson's on. Max is the CEO of uh, uh, the company formerly known as TenGen, who changed the name to MongoDB, which I think is a great move. MongoDB is a fantastic brand. It's got great uh, momentum in the marketplace. It's one of the leading NoSQL databases out there, if not the leading NoSQL. I know Mark Logic actually, uh, uh, Jeff Kelly's uh, quantified that, but sort of of the new NoSQLs, Mongo is probably the lead, has the leading adoption. We were down there, John, in May. You weren't able to do that conference. You were doing uh, Velocity, I believe, uh, with O'Reilly. And uh, so I went down there with Jeff Kelly. It was, uh, it was a great conference. They're really loyal fan base, MongoDB customers, and they stressed the ability to work with multi-structured data, That's and the simplicity of working with Mongo. Uh, Mongo's got a really good relationship with Amazon. Uh, we had a number of customers on in the financial services industry and in the web industry, so Max Shireson's coming on. Uh, he'll be our last guest on today. Interested in talking to him about getting an update on what's new with, uh, with Mongo, why the name change, and, and what's next you know, from here? You know, the database wars, John, as you pointed out uh, you know, two years ago, starting to get really interesting. It's, it reminds me of back in the 1980s, back in the day of Ingress and Formix, Sybase, you know, IBM battling it out. It was boring there for a while. Now the database business is uh, pretty exciting. So Dave, I want to ask your opinion about the Oracle announcements. Obviously you can see them up there, our databases of service, something we talked about earlier this morning. Um, What's your take on the cloud mobile social revolution? We asked a few guests earlier this uh, cube this morning and yesterday. We've asked obviously people at VMworld about it. You know, we're living in an inflection point now where we're seeing the massive shift, an inflection point that hasn't been seen of this massive uh, way since the inflection of the internet, web, and then before that client server, and then the PC revolution. Joe Tucci calls it platform three. What's your take on it? Well. You asked me first about, uh, about the databases service, the slide we have up here. I'll tell you something I like about, about, about Oracle. I mean, they, there's a lot of hyperbole. Uh, Oracle has a very bad habit of you know, comparing its current generation of product with somebody's you know, N minus two generation and claiming 10X performance or whatever it is. But what I like about Oracle is when it, when it makes an announcement like this database as a service, there's a lot to it. They clearly uh, are, have a lot going on in the pipeline and they're executing according to a plan and there's, there's meat in the bone. And I have to say, a lot of companies, and I would criticize EMC for this, a lot of their announcements at their big shows are futures. Now, to EMC's credit, they deliver on that, but a lot of it is futures. A lot of it is, okay, this is what's coming before the end of the year. You saw that with Viper. Uh, you've seen that with, with other announcements. You saw that with cloud and big data. When they make the announcement, there's not a lot there. They put forth vision. Now, again, to their credit, they execute on it, but Oracle very clearly has a, a dogma around delivering capabilities and particularly around a cadence of Oracle open world. So, so I like that. I, I think, you know, to the other part of your question, I think 
You know, we heard, we heard today, is it, we're in a two to three, three trillion dollar market, so there's a lot of business out there, there's a lot of ways to skin a cat. I've said this a number of times, this business is an oligopoly, you've got a few players who are controlling the chessboard. Oracle is clearly one of them, uh, I think uh, IBM is another, I think EMC and VMware are, are, are yet another, and there are you know, four or five other companies that are, that are really controlling that chessboard in the enterprise, but, and then of course, John, you have you know, the upstarts, the Googles, the Facebooks, yeah, the LinkedIn's, I mean, what do you, what's your take on all this? I mean, Dave, I see a couple things. When we were talking earlier when you were, in, you were out on the analyst briefing with the Oracle senior executives. I was with um, um, the uh, SVP, Eric Herzog of, of EMC, who's the SVP of product management, marketing. It's a guy who's been through five, seven acquisitions out of 10 startups he's done. Um, big time executive, managing the product portfolio. I asked him, are we in a flash bubble? Because he made a comment. I remember when five uh, megabyte disk drives were as big as a, an office. And then you know, I asked him, he said, yes, we're living in a bubble. I think that we are living in one of the most massive growth opportunities right now. I think we're at the beginning of a bubble of a growth. And I think next five years will be a tsunami of great wealth creation and disruption. The problem is, is that when the music stops, you better have a solution and a chair to sit on. Otherwise, you're going to be out in the cold. I think the VC-backed startups around Flash is already at risk. We're starting to see some consolidation. You're starting to see some players break out like Pure Storage. Pure Storage, $150 million in financing. Scott Dedson basically bet in the ranch and got the money to back it up that they're going to build a durable business. That's a great sign for Pure Storage. You're seeing Vera didn't get bought. Uh, you're seeing a lot of action, right? I mean, yeah, Whiptail and Cisco. Whiptail and Cisco. Uh, Violin's going to go public. IPO, you saw a Pure Storage IPO yeah, coming so up. Flash is already starting to make its sediment into its spots, settle into its spots. I think the bets are already played on Flash. I think there's going to be some innovation, but I think the big giants are going to come out of that crop. I don't think any more new guys are going to come in. I think there might be a, a, a Nutonix breakout, another Nutonix-like company. I think what Nutonix is doing is very interesting. So I, I think that's kind of key. The problem I have right now is companies like um, Dropbox and Box.net or Box.com or Box they call them now, um, they just had their uh, conference last week, Boxworks. I mean, I like this company, they're young, but I think they might be overplaying their hand a little bit, Dave, with their, with their solutions, because their event last week felt like they were trying to be like EMC, right? They try, like, almost like they manufactured an event because they, everyone else does it. And I think that like, that's a problem for them. I think ultimately they got to focus on the blocking and tackling of their business. I think for a box or a drop box to break into the enterprise is a very, very difficult nut to crack. Um, mainly because of, of the inertia. So I'd be curious to find out how much uh, momentum they really have in that area. And on the consumer side, I think with Google and Microsoft, the file sharing cloud business is not something that I think is going to be around. So the, you're seeing a lot of freemium startups, like Dropbox, like Box, trying to be enterprise. I just don't think they could turn into an enterprise company. You know, I just John, don't think it's uh, going to happen. You know, you remember the intranet? You remember the intranet versus the, the internet? And that whole thing kind of went away. Well, why'd it go away? Well, it went away because the oligopoly subsumed the intranet, and they just made it intranet. And same thing with the cloud. You know, you, all you heard about was, you know, cloud, 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 and then the oligopoly, by, by oligopoly I mean the, the leading enterprise players, IBM, HP, Oracle, EMC, et cetera, Microsoft, essentially co-opted the cloud and brought it to the enterprise. And I think you got to give a lot of credit to this generation of executives. You know, Joe Tucci talks about the waves and talks about how at each subsequent wave you have new leaders. I'm not so sure that past is prologue in that front. Because, yes, Wang, Prime, DG, Digital, a lot of company, Apollo, a lot of companies went out of business, East Coast mini com computer companies that, that didn't read the tea leaves, but these days, Intel, Microsoft, Cisco, EMC, Oracle, IBM, HP, these are Long-standing companies, rich history. They don't look to me, John, like they're going away. I mean, look at HP. HP is under fire, but here's HP coming back. Uh, Meg Whitman's vying for Joe Tucci for CEO of the decade. You know, <laughs> I'm not. It's early. It's, it's early in the Tucci. cycle. <laughs> it's too early to call that one. If Tucci, I mean, if Tucci retires in 2017. Uh, no, you can't compare uh, Meg to, Whitman. To, to you can't compare Meg Whitman to Joe Tucci. No, but it's Tucci. early, right? So she's yeah, got I mean, uh, seven years to go. But if, if Tucci retires in 2017, can he still get CEO of the decade? Yeah, of course. Can. I, I, definitely. I mean, here's the thing. Meg Whitman, to pull off a Joe Tucci-like uh, uh, credibility, if you will, 
is really about sustained performance. Meg Whitman has shown right now that um, she can message well, she can get the ship tightened up a bit, kind of rally the troops, find the right people in the company to put in the right position. She's also lost some key executives. Obviously the demotion of, not demotion, but the new position for Donatelli. No, he got demoted. <laughs> okay. You know, that's a fact. <laughs> Donatelli ain't going to run a lateral strategic move. M&A. Right? Yeah, it's not it's a technically a lateral. It's deal. technically a lateral move. Um, well, maybe not. Um, but it's still early. She has to put the string of pearls together. She needs to find, Meg Whitman needs to find the string of pearls for HP, meaning using Joe Tucci's analogy, as David Goulden points out, that, that, uh, you know, that federation. EMC has built their business over years of hard work, being a storage company. I mean, they really grew from being a storage company to a solutions company. They're in the big data space. They're building off that base. I think HP needs to do something similar find their center point, and then rebuild. If she could do that, Dave, she will definitely get a Steve Jobs, Joe Tucci-like credibility. But I'm not sure she's going to have the rope to do that. There's a lot of pressure on her, and I think uh, HP just got to move faster. Well, let's talk about that, John. We haven't really talked much about HP uh, at this event. I mean, are you, uh, are you a bear on HP at this point? <laughs> It's kind of late in the day, and I always say bad things about HP when it's late in the day, it gets me in trouble. Um, now, I'm bullish on HP, but you know, you, you can't help but have a bear mentality right now when you see just how slow they're moving, right? So, you know, ultimately, there's just a lot of bad, cl dark cloud over HP. There's just so much negative press around HP. Um, there's so much negative vibe going on around HP. I honestly don't know, Dave, how much of that's real, how much is not real, and I'm digging in there pretty hard. The, the areas that I look at HP, are, are bright. I mean, I'm looking at uh, Vertica, for instance, this is bright. How they handled the autonomy thing, I thought was excellent. I thought, you know, they overpaid, they took their medicine, and I think they've done a good job on how they handled that. They've integrated autonomy throughout HP. George Kadifa, the rising star uh, HP, is just the Donatelli move recently. They're just, taking their, their, they're just taking their medicine. So, at some point though, we want to move out of medicine into recovery, right? So, you know, if you're sick, you get better, and you have to show some, show some life, and I think HP needs to do that. Well, see, I, I, I have a slightly different take on, on this. I'd love to get your opinion. I mean, I think there is there's life. Uh, um, I always made the point, I always look at cash flow. Who's cash flow positive? You know, what's the balance sheet look like? And HP, you know, two years ago, had a horrendous balance sheet. Still needs to do some work, pay down the debt, but it's paying down the debt. Meg is aggressively paying down the debt. The company's cash flow positive. The stock, you know, up until recently is, is up. Year to date is still up. You know, it's up quite substantially uh, in the past 12 months. So um, um, I'm pleased about that. So the street is sort of buying into it, although how much lower could it go? And of course, it's, it's, it, 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 it's, it, it's got some work to do, but you know, do you think that HP can get back to its roots of invent? To me, that's the big question. Yeah, I think, I think they can. I think ultimately they can, you know, I've always been a big fan of HP having a mobile phone, and I think Dell is interesting, right? I think HP needs to look at what Michael Dell's doing right now and how he's executing, because what Michael Dell's doing is really, I think, the right playbook. Unfortunately, HP can't go private, so it's not, I'm not saying that's an option, but what Dell's doing is he's, he's retooling, right? He's retooling the entire company, he's retooling the entire company around the legacy walls of innovation that were set between different silos. He has to come out with a mobile phone. I don't care what anyone says, if you don't have an edge device of some kind in this modern era, you're not a computer player. It's just that's a fact, right? You got to have the hardware. I think Jobs and what Androids are doing, what Jobs and Apple has done and what Android's doing, is showing the way. Samsung became a player out of nowhere. They had a core competency in hardware and now a major player in the Android game. I think HP could have had a, a phone by now. I think Dell will have a phone. So I think HP needs to have that edge device. They got core competency in supply chain, find the right managers, put the SWAT teams together internally and get that done. I think HP can do that. So, and I think that one thing I'd add to HP, I've said this a number of times, HP in my view has to shrink to grow. Uh, I think this was the, the Donatelli fallout. I mean, I think he ran a business that was destined, uh, I, think, I think Donatelli and his team held that business up probably unnaturally longer than it should have been held up. And now, I mean, look at the server business, a tough, tough business, uh, and so, you said a bunch of executives have left. Meg has you know, purposefully, I think, made those changes. I think Donatelli uh, you know, was you know, the, the latest casualty, if you will. Donatelli's fine, nobody's crying for Dave. He's a good friend of theCUBE's, you know, seasoned executive, somebody who will 
do very, very well, whether it's inside or, or outside of HP. Dell's interesting, John. I mean, Dell going private says to me, Michael Dell sees that this turnaround is going to take a lot longer than he had hoped, doesn't want to do it as a public company because it's going to be too much pressure uh, and potentially somebody's going to take him out. So he owns a majority of the company, he wants to take it private. It's still a long way to go, but Michael Dell's relatively young, right? I mean, he's, uh, he's, he's your age. He's my <laughs> age. He's a billionaire and he's my age. So I just want to share with you, um, you know, some of the thinking around. I mean, I think Michael Dell has that 10X thinking and I think, you know, in talking to Michael Dell privately, Dave, I'm just trying to pull up my notes here around um, some of the things that uh, uh, we talked about. The, the thing about Dell is, He's young and he's got the energy to still manage the company. I think, you know, he made so much money with Dell Computer. He doesn't have to worry, ever worry about money again, so essentially he could retire. But, you know, retiring means you can just do whatever you want. I think he looks at the privatization of Dell as a swan song. He gets full control back. He gets to do it from scratch. It's, just, it's his own startup again. He gets a mulligan with all that cash flow. He gets another try at Dell. He gets another crack at the, at the, at the, at the prize and he can do it in a way that doesn't get public scrutiny. So imagine the employee focus, no longer on earnings to earnings calls, no longer on how we message this to the street, what's our Sarbanes-Oxley expo exposure, what are these distractions? This is public company hell. HP's living that nightmare. So Dell takes that off the table, they can do stuff internally, they don't have to report how their margins are, they can start cross-subsidizing, start re-engineering their architecture as a company, and if they're going to do that, my guess is they're going to do it with software because that's the key to success. That is what Dell's doing. So to me, that's what's going on. I think people who can do that, now compare that to HP, earnings, you have to earnings call Meg Whitman, the heat shield with PR up. She doesn't talk publicly. She posts on LinkedIn once in a while. It's a constant nightmare because every little thing that she says gets taken out of context. So their silence is deafening. At the same time, they need to be communicating right, that, to the health of the company. So that's a problem and I think that's just inherently what, they, what, the, what they're dealt right now and that's a problem. So John, I want, to talk, I want to change subjects a little bit and get your take on, you know, again, you're out here in the Valley. I want to talk about, let me just rattle some companies off. I want to talk about the, 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 the new internet companies, not, maybe not so new, but Facebook, Twitter is about to go public. I also want to talk about the sort of emerging enterprise companies, Workday, uh, obviously Salesforce very much established, ServiceNow, uh, Tableau, uh, and Splunk, you know, some of these guys. I feel as though, and Facebook is the other one. Now, two years ago when Facebook went public, whenever it was, a year and a half ago, um, it was really a, a, a debacle. Everybody, you know, I said as well, they got greedy. It wasn't a well-executed IPO. You at the time said you're still a bull on Facebook. Now, Facebook's up probably around 80% uh, in the last you know, six months, I want to say. Yeah. Stock's doing really well. Advertisers are beginning to see Facebook as a viable platform. Uh, you called that, I don't know if that's why you called it, but advertisers are saying, we advertise on Facebook, we know exactly who we're going to, not some proxy yeah, I mean, for, for a customer. So, what's your take on Facebook? Well Dave, thanks for the self-promotional plug. Yes, I did true. call you, you, Facebook. You did make that call. I did make that call early. I made that call uh, in 2007 on Facebook, 2008 on Twitter. Um, and I still think Twitter's going to be a lot bigger than people think. I think right now, they're um, kind of keeping it on the QT. They don't want to disclose some of the numbers, the confidential S1. But I'm bullish on Facebook because people didn't understand their ad model. And I think when they, when they filed the S1, it was all about the banner ads. And that's not really where the value is. Now, the problem with Facebook right now is, is that they're in a AOL problem. They are now truly stuffing their news feeds with really shitty ads, right? I mean, the ads are like, I mean like, they're bad, right? The ads are like not good. I mean, just not relevant. So they have the big data angle. That was what I saw Facebook having. So contextually, they have all the action. They got the behavior of the crowd. They have billions of users. Um, they have data science at their favor. That's the new ad model. That's what they're going after. As soon as they move out of these big fat impression ads in the, in the people's timeline, they're going to start moving to data science. So you're going to start to see Facebook selling that data and that's going to be valuable. Well, what about mobile, right? So that was a big criticism on, on Facebook. Twitter obviously doesn't have that problem because everybody's tweeting from their, from their devices. So it kind of leads me to the discussion about Facebook and mobile and Twitter. I feel like the Twitter IPO, the Facebook rebound, LinkedIn's strength is going to set off a, another 
you know, bubble, a big data bubble, or you know, Web 2.0 bubble. What Which bu the bubble we're already in, or? No, I think, <laughs> I think I think there was some air taken out of that bubble in the last 12 months, right? Because no, there were no. there were so many. Well, two years ago, I think it was a little more bubblicious to use a you know. A term. I mean, it was frothy in the sense that there was a lot of blind investments and blind ambition in some investors, but a lot of the insiders that were doing web scale and hyperscales we've been following saw the future, right? I mean, Zynga popped when in public. I mean, we, we, we kind of called Zynga, you know, who's going to play Farmville? And they didn't really take their game mechanics to a direction consumer that they should have. I think that was a big flaw with Zynga, but again, Zynga was not the consumer web. The consumer web was the hyperscale. It was the hyperscale market. It was the web guys that, that built their own. It was Facebook. And look what's coming out of that generation of entrepreneurs and uh, engineers. Open compute platform. Fundamentally changing how computers are built. I still think the data center of the future is going to be a lot like George Lessman from io.com talks about. New components, new racks. So a whole new generation of engineers are coming out. That's why I was kind of I'm bearish on Java. I mean, it's kind of sacrilegious to say it here at uh, Oracle Open World, but a whole new generation of engineers don't want Java. They want fully integrated stacks, automation, DevOps. They want to do whatever they want, have everything else be automatically reconfigured and, and managed with virtualization and other software. You come so out of college, you're saying, uh, I don't want to get a job program in Java. What do you want to get a no, They want to get again? a job building stuff. But right now, computer science is the hottest uh, career, computer science and data science right now, the hottest careers, and there's a jockey mentality, engineering mentality where, you know, the top smartest guys want to do this stuff. It's not like the nerds in the corner, you know, banging away on code anymore. It's like, it's cool to be a computer science architect. It's like, uh, like building a building, right? I mean, so it's very cool to do these things. These guys come out of the college, they don't care about downloading Linux patches. What they want is they want Linux, they want Hadoop, they want it stable, they want it on demand, fully automated, fully configurable, and they want to use the tool for the right job. That means Rails or Python or whatever they're going to do in the front end. So to me, that's what they want. The other guys coming in underneath the covers will want to do caching, set up infrastructure, and do all that stuff. So, you know, the old model of computer science is going to transition quickly to kind of an athletic, you know, musicianal kind of thing where people are really rocking and rolling and having some, you know, doing some badass things with code. So, software is the future and the software paradigms are changing. Okay, John, and now, now I, want to, I want to talk about some of the emerging enterprise guys. The, I'll call them uh, buy on dip companies. Workday, Salesforce, ServiceNow, Tableau, whose symbol is data, and Splunk. Um, they're like the big four or five that, that we're kind of tracking here. I mean, these companies are driving hard. A lot of people you know, are concerned about their, their, that they're, they may be overvalued, but they keep going up and up and up. Um, what about these companies? I mean, this combination of cloud, we've got uh, visualization in there, um, we got big data in there. What's your sense of these emerging enterprise companies, you know, Workday in particular, but also ServiceNow, Frank Slootman's company, you know, Splunk, big data play, Tableau leveraging big data, and obviously Salesforce as the established, you know, giant now in this business. What's your take about those new enterprise yeah. guys? Are they going to eat into the, to yeah, the yeah. oligopoly? <laughs> Well, Dave, I have an opinion on this, as you know, so here's my take on this. And you know, we watch these companies closely and we know a lot of the guys personally at these companies. There's two types of companies out there and you want to look at the, the companies from the following lens. And this is the way I, I tell my friends. Look at these companies and evaluate Workday, Box, Dropbox, Splunk, um, even Mark Logic I would consider kind of an emerging startup. Are they hiding the ball? Are they actually publicly disclosing what they're doing? A lot of these companies are faking it till they make it. A lot of these guys um, will either have some sort of manufactured niche feature product. As we say, it's a feature, not a company. That's the old adage in Silicon Valley. And a lot of those guys will try to hide the ball and rush to build out fast. They'll try to put some additional meat around the bone to make them look like an enterprise company. So that's, that's one way to look at it. Who's hiding the ball? Who has the meat on the bone? Who doesn't? And then the second thing to look at is management. Are the, are the management teams of these companies experienced? Have they been through the cycle before? Do they know what to do, right? So when I look at the companies, I ask myself, okay, how many cycles of innovation have these managers been through? You've got a guy like Gary Bloom, right? He's been through up and down probably four or five major cycles. You know what to do when you're in a growth cycle. Just get in the growth, get in the growth curve. 
So that's kind of how I look at it, Dave. And I think ultimately it's really, really hard to build a durable enterprise business. It takes experience. It takes guys to actually show the moves, not hide the ball. And I highlighted uh, Workday as an example of one of those companies that's doing well, not hiding the ball. Experienced management team, they know what to do. Pure storage, another company knows what to do. Um, and other companies that are fumbling, trying to you know, walk and quack like an enterprise company. I put Box in that category. Love this company, Box. However, it just scares me they're just trying too hard to be enterprisey, Dave. I just don't see it, right? I don't see the numbers, I don't see the successes, I don't see the, uh, the, the press releases on the number of new enterprise customers they're getting. I see a lot of you know, window dressing. I don't see a lot of meat on the bone. So Dropbox is the same way. You know, I love Dropbox, but it's a freemium consumer company trying to be uh, enterprise. To me, show me how many clients you have besides credit card customers. So to me, Box and Dropbox are examples of companies that have huge enterprise potential but seem like they're hiding the ball. And, yeah. and, and, and you know, having an event doesn't make you an enterprise company. Well, it's kind of like I was saying before, remember the intranet, uh, what happened is the oligopoly co-op to them. I feel like they'll do the same thing with a lot of these you know, file sharing services. Is you're seeing a lot of you know, the enterprise companies emer emerge with that capability. And I just think enterprise customers are going to trust that, they're going to deliver that as a service to their clients. You know, we talked a lot here on theCUBE about uh, the IT imperative of going to IT as a service, how they're competing with cloud service providers in a sense, I put competing in quotes. I think generally the enterprise has done a pretty good job of cutting costs and moving to a model that is IT as a service, and this is one of the examples yeah. that I think you see. Well, I mean, look at That's EMC. Delivered. Let's look at EMC, how they do their acquisitions. Look at IBM, HP, and EMC. Huge companies that do a lot of M&A. So, to me, the enterprise companies of the future, like Splunk and like Workday, Pure Storage of the world, they need to demonstrate execution success. That means taking some share of a market away or a new market that they're carving out that's going to be the new market for the incumbent. That's success. And Splunk, Workday are doing that. I'm not sure that some of the other companies we're talking about have done that. Now, let's take Cloudera for instance. I think Cloudera is one of those companies that to me is like on a border 50-50 between those two, right? Like, I see Cloudera kicking some serious butt. At the same time, I see them struggling trying to maybe get capped out. Maybe they don't make that growth. So Are they going to do an IPO? I think Cloudera has to go. I, I think they got a lot of IPO potential, but you got to have an engine of sales, Dave. You got to have a, a, a flywheel going on, on the revenue side. So, you know, the Hadoop market is just so booming right now, I just haven't seen that moment. I mean, they have a lot of funding, they got a new office, they're looking good, new team, but new CEO, new marketing department, new team, I haven't seen anything. Haven't why the change at CEO, you think? Why, why did, why did the, the board decide to move Mike from CEO to chief tra strategy officer? You know, officer? I don't know. I, I met with Mike Olson uh, two weeks ago. We didn't talk about that. We talked about some other things in the business. Um, and you know, I don't even think I didn't, I didn't even go there and ask them the question. I think no, I know, that's why I can ask you, because I know that you guys have a you know, yeah, I mean, I think close Mike, personal relationship. I think Mike Olson um, was ready to pass the baton over. What Mike Olson did with Cloud Air with the team, with Amar Awadala and uh, Hacking Data, Jeff Hummerbacher, is they established a company from ground zero of the big data movement and built an awesome company, great team. And they were like, when you ramp up that, that, much, that much of a company, you've got to go to the next level. You got to bring the operators in, you got to bring the suits, you got to bring the business model in, and you got some serious funding and bu company building to do. So I think Cloudera just needed to move to that stage of building. Mike Olson's an entrepreneur, he built that company up, he was stage one CEO, and you know, it's a, it's a five year journey for Mike, and you know, combination of just, hey, you know, pass it on, be chairman, sit back, do some strategy, because strategy is the chessboard where Cloudera is really have a lot of pressure on with Hortonworks and others is what chess moves do they make on the product side and in the market. So to me, Mike Olson's actually better fit for the chessboard in that space and bring an operator in to run the, run the worker bees. So we have uh, Sam, Lu uh, uh, Sam Lucido coming up later on today. Uh, he's coming on at 3.40 Pacific time. We're going to talk about the juxtaposition of or Oracle's vertically integrated stack versus sort of the EMC approach, the EMC, VCE, VMware, the, the horizontal approach. Mike Olson's coming on, uh, uh, as we were just talking about, Chief Strategy Officer and Chairman of the Board at Cloudera, and also Max Shireson, CEO of formerly the company known as TenGen, now MongoDB. John and I will be here all day. We're also here tomorrow. 
I want to just do a quick uh, announcement. I want to do a, I guess, it's a, I guess it might be a PSA or, or more of a cube value add, but some sad news in the cloud startup world. Uh, uh, Nirvonix is closing down, gives the customers two weeks notice to get the data out, Dave. We've uh, followed Nirvonix, we were bullish on Nirvonix, um, but the story that I heard was some mangled financing and some just some material, the cracking around the foundation, too much inertia, too much inertia around the company, uh, but here they have cloud storage and huge customer bases, and now two weeks to clear your data out, that's not enough time, so I want to plug out to Oxygen Cloud, Great company we've had on theCUBE before. Uh, Julie just gave me a tweet yesterday that they'll move, migrate the data over from Nirvonix. So if you're a Nirvonix customer, you're watching this, uh, go to Oxygen Cloud. Great, great company to move your data I mean, to. really it's a shame. So Nirvonix had, you know, as you know, we've covered it here. They had a number of uh, cloud service providers, a number of customers in the, uh, in the, uh, in the entertainment business, you know, data intensive uh, customers. Two weeks to move your data out. A lot of these customers have a lot of data. That's not a lot of time. Uh, Nirvonix was a company that during the uh, tsunami in Japan uh, made available its cloud to help people you know, uh, uh, get data. Uh, and, and so it really is a shame. What happened really is Kosla came in, uh, they got, you know, I, I say got rid of you know, Genero, Scott Genero, who's been in the Cube a number of times, chose to leave, or who knows, maybe the VCs pushed them out regardless. I guess they chose not to keep the thing going. So uh, it really is a shame. It was a, <clears throat> Good concept, a lot of people liked the idea originally, but I think the bottom line on Nirvonix, it just didn't have the tech, John. It was building on tech that really wasn't going to allow the company to scale and be cost competitive with uh, the Amazons of the world. And so, uh, I think Amazon just moved too fast. It's hard to compete with Amazon. I mean, Amazon right now is crushing it. If you're looking at Amazon right now, you look at those guys are just so excellent at what they do. If you're a developer, who wants to get up and running on Amazon. It is the most fantastic developer environment on the planet, in my opinion. Um, certainly at a certain point, you got to scale, you move to bare metal. But if you're a developer, you want to maximize your efficiency, you got to go to Amazon, you got to have a cloud. And the pressure is obviously coming in from uh, Microsoft with uh, Azure and with VMware. So those cloud environments will be a requirement. I think they're going to be a great environment for public activities, for development, for, for sandboxes, and for programming, testing, and then moving to an on-premise or bare metal. So, this is theCUBE, this is the coverage of the, of the keynote. We're going to stay with the keynote. What's the, what's the timetable here we're going to do? So, uh, uh, so we don't go on with Sam Lucido until 3.40. This was supposed to be Larry uh, Ellison's. If you're just joining us, Larry Ellison uh, is not here at Oracle Open World. <laughs> he had something better to do, which was to watch his uh, America's Cup team uh, compete against the Kiwis. Uh, if you didn't see, uh, the uh, uh, Team Oracle USA came back, tied it up, uh, the, uh, uh, in the penultimate race, the final is tomorrow. Um, so we're going to be going back uh, with uh, our guest coverage at 3.40. I also want to mention, John, next week we're going to be at the Splunk.conf conference. We were there last year. Splunk.conf is a great conference. Splunk is innovating in big data. Splunk is a company that essentially takes log data and makes sense out of it. Helps a lot of IT customers. We're also going to be at Strata and, and, and Hadoop World. The Cube will be there. Uh, and then uh, we hope to be at, at IBM IOD. We were there last year. We'll see if we're going to be there this year. We're going to be at Amazon reInvent. We're also going to be at HP Discover. So very excited about that. So some news coming up from the keynote. Oh, by the way, HP Discover's in Barcelona. I just wanted to yeah, give a great, little plug Yeah, great lineup for the fall window. Also, we got uh, on October 9th, I'll be hosting a panel with uh, General Electric CEO. Jeffrey uh, Immelt. You're going to be hosting a panel for Jeff Immelt. That's awesome yeah, that so, they, so you were selected to do that, John. They're doing the industrial internet. It's a really big deal. A lot of top customers from United, uh, ch uh, chairman of Uni vice chairman of United Airlines, big oil, uh, Shell, um, Standard Oil, Top industrial companies talking about big data. That's going to be Mines uh, Conference on October 9th in Chicago. I'll be Are you going to ask them about metadata? <laughs> <laughs> uh, they need big data analytics. <laughs> they, that's fast, that's machine data. It's Joe Tucci talking about the industrial internet. Uh, some breaking news here from the keynote on cloud storage, since we talked about Nirvonix, is Oracle's infrastructure as a service will support OpenStack. For right. private public cloud building. We heard that so, this morning from Thomas so, Curian. That's so, right. Interesting. Yeah, so I think that I think Oracle has to support Embrace VMware. It's got to support OpenStack. You know, I think eventually Oracle's going to have to open up its APIs to things like hybrid columnar compression. It won't initially because it's going to use it as a competitive advantage, but Oracle has to balance that fine line between competing and 
endearing itself to its ecosystem and its customers. <laughs> well, Jay, I think OpenStack is the hottest area right now, and I certainly Oracle is going to look at uh, uh, OpenStack as a, uh, what does Pat Gelsinger call it? Incremental opportunity, mar uh, market extension. <laughs> well, you know, again, what, this what is, is where I give the oligopoly credit. You know, 10, 15 years ago, by the oligopoly, I mean the large established IT players like IBM, HP, you mean the cartel? EMC, the cartel, Oracle. 10 or 15 years ago, they would have poo-pooed anything that threatened you know, their cash flow, their largesse, their install base. Today what they do is they're smarter than that. They look at the trends, they talk to their customers, they stay close to their customers, say, you know what, we're going to look at that as an opportunity. We realize if we don't, we're going to get, we're going to turn into the next, you know, Prime, Wang, DG, and Deck. So I give them a, a lot of credit for that. I think you've seen it with VMware, you're now seeing it with Oracle, not to the extent that you see it uh, with, with VMware embracing uh, OpenStack. But you know, here's the thing, John. We've done some research in the Wikibon community and, and we have seen that 50% of the customers say, we are will, willing to risk lock-in to get function, to get integration, and to get single stack simplicity. Now, that's an interesting trend. Only 15% say they're dogmatic about open source. Now I say only 15%, that's a good toehold for initiatives like OpenStack. And as you and I have talked about over time, we think that you know, open source ultimately matures to the point where it wins in the business. You certainly saw that with Linux and you've seen it with other initiatives. You're seeing it now with Hadoop. And um, so a lot of news out there in the, in the web, Dave. Obviously Microsoft um, passed on BlackBerry. Um, BlackBerry obviously announcing uh, a deal to go private. Huge fall from grace. BlackBerry was the, uh, the called the Crackberry, you know, back in the day. The smartphone, first real smartphone in the market. And ultimately, just the iPhone just killed it. I want to I want to give another shout out to, to Furrier. You actually have some really good calls. You and I were talking. Uh, I was actually prepping for a meeting that I had with a client on, on Microsoft. I've followed Microsoft for years, but I really didn't know the, the inside baseball as well as John did. And you said the big question is, this is before the Nokia acquisition, you said the big question is, will Microsoft try to do an Android-like, Windows-like you know, ecosystem, or will it try to integrate like Apple? You said, my bet is it's going to be more of an Apple vertical integration. Two weeks later, Microsoft announced it's getting into the hardware business, you know, in earnest, and, and bought Nokia. So another great call by you. Well, I, pre I appreciate it, Dave, but uh, you know, ultimately, this is back to my comment around not having an edge device for these manufacturers. Look at Microsoft. They were a software company now with, a, with their own device. HP is a hardware company trying to be software company, so we see the, the bright spots within HP, back to our HP conversation, Vertica, George Kadifa, that organization. So, the tail's wagging the dog, you know? HP becomes more of a software player, Microsoft becomes a hardware player. I mean, come on, what, what, you know, what, what world are we living in? Well, I've said this a number of times, HP absolutely has to increase its software content. HP brags about it being the sixth largest software company in the world. It's a ridiculous uh, data point. I, I've said this to George Kadifa, I think they should stop saying that and just focus on increasing the proportion of HP's revenue that comes from software, whether it's through acquisition, which Meg will start to make, I think, I think Meg's going to start making acquisitions once she pays down the debt. I think all those acquisitions need to be in, in software companies, you know, new emerging software companies, you know, the autonomy acquisition, we can go on and on and on about that. They've got to leverage that autonomy acquisition to get some value out of that. But HP absolutely should be, you know, within the top three or four software companies in the world. So check out uh, CrowdSpots coming up. Keep an eye out for CrowdSpots and CrowdChat.net, our new product where we go out and, and bring group chats on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever social networks in the crowd. Uh, and Dave, keep an eye out for our, my new Twitter handle where we'll be rolling this out, not just in mine, I'm using it now, the Crowd Captain. Yes, crowd, I've been contacted the, by the crowd captain. <laughs> the crowd now captain is out <laughs> there. Um, you got the guy from the love boat, well, the captain I mean, of the love boat. Well, I mean, there. ironically, <laughs> Twitter just announced today that they're creating a, a new Twitter handle called Magic Rex, Magic R-E-C-S, essentially to do what the crowd captain is doing, which is make recommendations for people. This is the future of the internet, this is the social media. Being connected is one thing, but having the intimate relationships with others is what we see the future is, and that's what the cube is all about, that's what Silicon Angle Wikibon's all about. We will be providing recommendations, kind of like Follow Friday, but doing it in vertical markets. We're going to be using the crowd captain, Dave, to bring thought leaders in to chat, and use our recommendation engine of CrowdSpots. So, so I want to talk about CrowdSpots for a second. I want to talk about what's trending right now at Oracle Open World. Oracle Open World, you know, 13, the hashtag is obviously the number one trending. 
EMC was number two all morning during the Joe Tucci keynotes. It's still trending, it's probably around five or six. Oracle's trending, the cloud. America's Cup is number four. Keynote, responsive design. I, I love CrowdChat because what was happening is the spammers were spamming the Oracle open world, OOW13. Yeah. Uh, uh, Man Crush Monday got in there I, yesterday. I, I showed you this morning how, many, how much spam there was yeah. in the hashtag. Well, the machine learning capability of CrowdSpots have, has, has virtually wiped that all out. I love it. Yeah. So you're able to get a much better signal now. CSC is also trending. CSC is in the news. So, yeah, they're, so they're, they're making some moves as well. And if you look at the trending stories, that's the other capability I love. Uh, this morning, um, EMC still trending. Um, it's a, a story about uh, EMC Networker. I guess the EMC, the EMC social media crew was pumping that out. They just but, they just surpassed SiliconANGLE TV yeah, for Oracle, most share, uh, second most shared link. Oracle Open World is live, so we track the links that are being actually, shared. Actually, if you look at our two numbers, the combined scores, we're actually in uh, third, second place behind Oracle. Yeah, so, so EMC's now in third place on trending stories, not trending tweets. As stories are what links have been shared the most. Right now, the number one shared link for today at Oracle Open World is the live feed. And the number two shared link is siliconangle.tv, that's us. And the third share, most shared link is the EMC Networker 8.1 video for Oracle. That's that, amazing. That Targeted is. to DBAs. One of the things you've seen, uh, and we're going to talk to Sam Lucido about this, EMC focused on the keynote this morning, which I thought the keynote this year was way better than last year. Last year was sort of all over the place. It really wasn't clear on the messaging. This year, <laughs> the messaging was crisp and right on the DBA. If you're going to be at Oracle Open World, you're going to spend a million bucks, you better talk to the DBAs because those guys got the juice. EMC did that uh, this year. I thought it was really well done by, by Tucci setting up Jeremy Burton and, uh, and Sam Mosito actually gave the demo, so that was good. We're going to talk to Sam about that and what EMC brings to the DBA. This is a big, big move in the install base. EMC has 80,000 customers. It doesn't typically you know, sell to the DBA. It sells to the infrastructure heads, but the DBA and the application heads are where all the action is, John, inside of Oracle. You, you know what's interesting on the trending dashboard here, that's, that's uh, a black swan in my opinion, or an outlier in this data is, the responsive design. So you're seeing a lot of developers here. So if you look at the data, if you want to get some insight out of the ver what's going on in the vertical, is responsive design is a trending topic. So what you're seeing being discussed is a, the agile developer kind of DevOps. That to me is a trend indicator, Dave, that this whole world is colliding with the DevOps culture. We were just talking about how you know, Yahoo, Google, Facebook, Twitter, all these web scale companies are creating the DevOps movement. It's kind of, you can see early on, we'll make a call right now at 2013 that Oracle Open World for the next two, three years will be very heavily DevOps focused. And that makes a lot of sense if you look at what's trending, right? Yeah, it's talking about don't miss your audience, how to prioritize in the, in the development process. I mean, these are critical factors for, for developers. Yeah. The whole developer thing, the DevOps piece, you know, agile moving into DevOps and beyond DevOps has really changed the way in which applications are getting created and, and deployed, uh, almost in a disposable sense, John. It's, it's amazing. Oracle Cloud, again, this is cloud meets big data, cloud meets uh, storage. Again, Dave, back to our 2010 storage is sexy theme. Uh, we talked with Joe Tucci about storage is still the center of the value proposition, still, today. Well, even, even Ellison says, he's got, he got that little clip, it's not the you know, PC age, it's not the, 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 the smartphone age, it's the information age, they call it. EMC strategy has always been around the data made that bet, Dick Egan made that bet you know, 30 years ago. Uh, everybody else said, all right, we're going to invest in servers. And look at the server business today, it's just a bloodbath. So, it's all about the data, John. All so, about the uh, any, any other observations on the crowd spotting from your standpoint? Uh, well, it's just, you know, we talk about real time, people trying to make Hadoop real time. <laughs> crowd spots, it is real time. Uh, it's a fantastic capability. Crowd chat, crowdchat.net, uh, you know, I love it. I think it's, a, maybe we should describe what it is. It's essentially, you remember the old AOL chat rooms, like an IRC channel? It's like that, except the difference is it's, it's open, it's public. It's so everything that gets published there gets we'll, also published We'll be releasing the, some new code next to the week. Web. But crowd to the internet, uh, to the Twitter, rather. Yeah, but the crowd spots are essentially people in the crowd and their activities. And we have a technology that can mo monitor that and uh, it's proprietary to what we do. Um, but right now for the Oracle Open World hashtag, which is essentially Oracle Open World 13, Oracle Open World, you know, general, a few keywords, social keywords, there's 9,449 unique people identified on Twitter, 36,000 total tweets, eight tweets a minute, that's down from 27 tweets a minute, which was the keynote flow. 
Um, so that's, you know. Yeah, uh, I, I believe it when Oracle says there's 60,000 people here. It, it's actually, it sometimes doesn't feel like that inside of Moscone, but when you walk around the streets of San Francisco, you definitely feel like there's 60,000 people there. The ring, I, reason I bring that up, we're talking about 9,400, 90,450 people that we've identified unique people tweeting at this event. What'd you say, 37,000 tweets. Those are good numbers for, uh, for you know, we're, we're a day and a half into the event, John. It's pretty amazing. Okay, so let's, let's uh, take a break. We're going to come back. Uh, any final words on this segment in the keynote? Obviously yeah, so uh, obviously you're hearing a lot about cloud. You're hearing a lot about you know, Oracle's integrated cloud. I think they, they're, they're delivering a lot of the capabilities. In the, in the, in the war of checkboxes, Oracle salespeople can check virtually every box there is. So Oracle we've seen go from you know, five years ago, four years ago, Larry Ellison denigrating cloud. They're all in on cloud. They understand that their customers need it. And they've got an offering there. And like I said, it's a high rent district, but a lot of customers, CEOs, CIOs, are willing to pay those rents. Okay, this is Silicon Angle's coverage. Breaking news, Larry Ellison did not make the keynote. 5,000 people leave in droves. Um, America's Cup is tied at 8-8, final sailing race tomorrow uh, for the, all the marbles for the cup. Will America retain the cup? Congratulations to Larry Ellison on that win. Disappointing and, and uh, sober moment for the folks here at Oracle Open World. But hey, better news tomorrow. If Oracle wins, if Oracle wins, then they will be in the big party race. We got people photo bombing us here inside <laughs> the cube. <laughs> Gotta love that. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. Like that scene Stay in, with uh, us. Like that scene in Rocky, John, right? Hey, <laughs> yeah, yeah. the meat guys <laughs> in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll be right back. Come back for more coverage. Uh, great activity here. John and Dave will be con continuing the commentary throughout the day. Be right back after this short break.